Good morning and welcome back to the Monday study group. It is the Monday before Ash Wednesday and so the season of Lent is upon us and the season of Epiphany is ending. Tomorrow is Shrove Tuesday and many churches have pancake suppers or other celebrations uh, to mark the end of Epiphany and the beginning of Lent. On Ash Wednesday, which is this Wednesday, which also co is coordinate this year with Valentine's Day, interestingly enough, and also the opening of baseball season in the sense that pitchers and catchers are due to report for spring training on Wednesday. All kinds of things happening on Wednesday. But for me, the most important is the season of Lent beginning and Valentine's Day is a more of a private celebration in uh, between couples and in families. Let me read to you the prayer from the Book of Common Prayer uh, that begins Ash Wednesday, and we'll use that as the prayer to start our study today of Acts chapter 26. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing you have made and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. And therefore, I invite you in the name of the Church to the observance of a holy Lent, by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, self-denial, almsgiving, and by the reading and meditating on God's holy word, and to make a right beginning of repentance as a mark of our mortal nature, we now kneel before the Lord, our Maker and Redeemer. And then there's a set of prayers that follow uh, in the Anglican tradition for Ash Wednesday. But as a mark of uh, our keeping a holy Lent, we can read and meditate on God's holy word. And that's partly what we're doing today as we study the book of Acts, chapter 26, nearing the end of our time. Next week, the Monday study group will select what we're going to study next, and, and many things have been proposed. In the Bible, uh, the study of Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon and Hebrews have been suggested. In the writings of the early Christians of the second century, the letters of Ignatius of Antioch have been suggested. And with regard to other books, The Practice of the Presence of God by Carmen Acevedo Butcher, her translation of Brother Lawrence's The Practice of the Presence of God has been suggested. Praying the Jesus Prayer with Others, a book by two Anglican clergymen on the Jesus Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. A classic prayer from hundreds and hundreds of years in earlier in the Christian tradition. And then finally, uh, a book by Luke Timothy Johnson on basic Christian theology called The Creed. And all those have been suggested, and we will make a decision among them next week and communicate that to everybody in case you would like to continue in the study of whatever we do next. And if it is one of the biblical books, I will have suggestions for commentaries to use. All right, enough preliminaries. That take, took almost five minutes of our time. Uh, let's look at Acts chapter 26. So Paul, having uh, appealed to the emperor in chapter 25, and King Agrippa, 
having come to visit Festus, the Roman governor in Caesarea, Paul is now making a defense of his life before both Festus and Agrippa and Bernice and a whole room full, a hall full of people who have gathered to see the king, Agrippa, and to see this examination of a Jew named Paul who has been accused of certain crimes by the Jewish authorities in Rome, particularly the Sadducees and the household of the high priest. And so, as 26 opens, Agrippa the king gives Paul permission to speak for himself. And so Paul begins his self-defense. This is not a trial and the end of which there would be some kind of judicial decisions. But Festus has asked Agrippa to hear Paul so that he, Festus, might know what to write in the bill of charges that is going to accompany Paul to Rome when his case will be heard by the emperor. Paul appealed to the emperor in order not to be sent back to Jerusalem to be tried by the Jewish authorities there concerning whom Paul feared for his life. And so Paul begins in verse 2 with a kind of standard ingratiating comment to the one before whom you are making your defense. And he says that he is fortunate to appear before Agrippa to make his defense today against the accusations made against him because Agrippa is especially familiar with the customs and controversies of the Jewish people. He is himself uh, very familiar with uh, Judaism and we don't know quite how he acquired all that information and knowledge, but Paul believes that Agrippa knows the scriptures and that he understands the teachings of Judaism. And so he asks Agrippa to listen to him patiently. That is a very standard opening of a speech in a hearing in which a person is making a self-defense. So now Paul begins to tell about his life and to, to describe himself in a way that would inform Agrippa and Festus and others who are listening just who he is and what his life has been about. And so he says that from his youth, he has spent a life among his own people and in Jerusalem. We don't know at what age Paul went to Jerusalem. Was it as a, as a child, as a young man? We know that at least as a young man, he came under the uh, teaching of Rabbi Gamaliel and was a Pharisee along with the school of the Pharisees that Gamaliel belonged to, the strictest sect, Paul says, of our religion. I have belonged to that sect and others can testify to this because I am not somebody who is unknown to the authorities in Jerusalem. I have lived there a good long time, a good percentage of my life. And he wants Agrippa to know that he is on trial, even though, again, this is not an official hearing, a judicial hearing, but Paul is referring to the general sense that he is now a prisoner and on trial, he believes on account of his hope in the promises of God to our ancestors. This probably includes things like the kingdom of God, the restoration of the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, the new heaven and the new earth that Isaiah talked about, resurrection from the dead that is alluded to in several passages in the Old Testament and explicitly mentioned in Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. So it's these kinds of promises that God made to our ancestors, a promise that our 12 tribes 
hope to attain. Well, that's unusual to say because there are no 12 tribes. There's only two tribes left. Ten of the tribes were lost 700 years earlier in 722 BC when the Assyrians conquered the 10 northern tribes and took them away, assimilating them into the, Syri the Assyrian culture of the 8th century BC. There have not been 12 tribes for over 700 years, nearly 800 years. And Paul is talking about the hope promised to the 12 tribes, which includes the restoration of the 12 tribes of Israel in some Jewish apocalyptic thinking. Jesus mentioned that the, the apostles would sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel, unless that's symbolic and not to be taken literally. Uh, there is there the repetition of the hope that the 12 tribes would somehow be restored and be ruled by the apostles. So that whole idea of the restoration of the 12 tribes remained alive uh, in some forms of Judaism in the first century. It is for this hope, Paul says, <clears throat> O King, you know, the RS, NRSV says, Your Excellency, but the Greek text simply says, O King, that it is for this hope, O King, that I am accused by Jews. Not by all the Jews. There are Christian Jews and there are Pharisees who agree with Paul, although disagree with some parts of his application of Judaism to the Gentiles. But he's mainly been accused by the Sadducees and by the Jewish authorities <clears throat> of the Sanhedrin and the high priest's family in Jerusalem. Verse 8, why is it incredible that any, by any of you that God raises the dead? Well, this clearly points that Paul has been speaking about the promise God made to our ancestors and the restoration of Israel included the idea of a resurrection of the dead at the end of time, at the end of history, in the last days. Uh, the, again, Daniel 12, uh, the first three verses of Daniel 12 talk about a, a general resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous and a final judgment. And that this is a part of what Paul is referring to when he says, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Uh, this promise of resurrection was well established by the first century and was an article of belief that Paul shared with the Pharisees, but that was rejected by the Sadducees. And keep in mind that it is mainly Sadducees who are Paul's accusers. Then in verses 9 to 11, we have Paul telling how dedicated he was to wiping out the early Christian movement within Judaism. That is, all the earliest Christians were Jews, and they believed that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, but that seemed absolutely absurd and impossible to those who believed that the Messiah could never die and that there were no promises in the Old Testament which talked about the death and resurrection of the Messiah. But, but it became evident to the early Christians that Jesus was the Messiah, that he died on the cross, and three days later rose from the dead and was experienced to be alive and appeared to his disciples and to more than 500 people at one time, and to many others. So they had in their historical memory the actual resurrection of Jesus and encounters with Jesus, similar to the encounter that Paul had with Jesus on the road to Damascus. It was this sect of the Jews that arose after the resurrection of Jesus, claiming that Jesus was the Messiah, that Paul thought was absolutely heretical. 
Saul, using his Hebrew name, that Saul thought was absolutely heretical and needed to be wiped out even to the point of imprisonment and putting early Christians to death. So he says he was thoroughly a part of that. He locked up people in prisons, cast his vote when they were being condemned to death. I think that probably means that he approved of it, not that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. That seems unlikely given Paul's age, uh, that he would have been a part of that senior uh, body of uh, established elders. There were usually no younger persons a part of the Sanhedrin. But Paul was, not only did Paul believe <clears throat> that the early Christians were wrong, but he believed that they should be punished and forced to blaspheme the name of Jesus. He was furious, furiously enraged at them and even had letters from the high priest in Jerusalem to pursue Christians to other cities like Damascus <coughs> and to arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem for trial. It was on, it was when Paul was fully engaged in that sense of opposition that something radical happened to him to change him into a believer of the very things that he had been physically, violently opposing. I think verses 9 to 11 are to establish Paul's credibility as somebody who had been thoroughly on the side of his opponents. Something must have happened to change him from being somebody who would never have been put on trial by the accusations of the, the Sadducees and some of the Pharisees because he would have been doing the very things they thought should be done to early Christians who were claiming Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. So now Paul is one of the people that he was thoroughly opposed to. Something radical must have happened. And of course, that's what's next in Paul's autobiography. He says, with these persecutions and this point of view in mind, verse 12, I was traveling to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, to arrest Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem, when suddenly, at midday, along the road, O king, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and my companions. So it, there was not only the light of the sun that was uh, shining around all of Paul's companions, but another light, brighter than the sun, overshadowing even the brightness of the sun, struck Paul and his companions to the ground. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice. Apparently the others did not hear the voice. The voice spoke to Paul in his native language, Aramaic. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It hurts you to kick against the goads. Now that's the first time that we have heard that Jesus said a proverb that was well known in the ancient world. It's, it occurs in Aeschylus and other Roman writers and Greek writers uh, like Aeschylus. Uh, you, if you look in your commentary, you can see that it was a well-known proverb, it hurts you to kick against the goads, means it's hard for you to fight against your destiny. It is hard for you to fight against that which is going to happen to you. And so the voice from heaven speaks to Paul and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul wasn't persecuting Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth, he thought, was dead and buried. He was persecuting those who believed that Jesus of Nazareth was alive and risen from the dead. But apparently, so closely associated are Jesus' followers with Jesus himself. In fact, his very body 
as Paul came to think of it, that to persecute Jesus' followers is to persecute Jesus. And so the voice also said, it is hard for you to kick against the goads, to go against that which is being uh, prodded in the, you, to prod you in the direction that God has a plan for you. And so I asked, who are you, sir, or who are you, Lord? And the Lord, that is now capital L, the Lord answered, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. You're not just persecuting my followers. I am the risen Christ, and you are persecuting me. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for a reason. And that reason is the purpose of your life. I am giving you your reason for living. I am giving you your reason, your purpose, so that every morning when you get up, you will know what you are about. I am appointing you to serve and to testify to the things which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. In other words, Paul is to be a witness. He is to give a testimony to his experience of what has happened to him, what he has seen and heard, and, and that is his main purpose in life, is to be a witness and a testifier to his experience with the risen Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. Further, Paul said, uh, Jesus said to Paul, I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. And of course, this lumps the Jewish people with the Gentiles with whom they did not want to be lumped together. And this is part of their anger at Paul is that he would treat the Gentiles in the same way that he treats the Jews and vice versa, that he would treat the Jewish people as if they were to be lumped together with the Gentiles. Now, this promise that I will rescue you from your people and the Gentiles, uh, some people in our group today understood this to mean that I will rescue you from what is wrong about the beliefs of the Sadducees and the chief priests, those aspects of first century Judaism that are not compatible with Christianity as it was emerging from Judaism. I will rescue you from the wrong parts of Judaism and from the wrong parts of the pagan worldview. I will rescue you from that which is wrong about both Judaism and paganism. I think that's possible, but I think it's more likely that this is a promise to rescue Paul from the uh, from being put to death by the persecutors who were both Jews and Gentiles. And so this promise of protection from God uh, did not include, as we know already, rescue from any persecution but the assurance that Paul, that God would be with Paul and that these persecutions would not ultimately be his death. Although, in the end, of course, Paul does die uh, in Rome by the Roman authorities. So, Paul is being sent to both Jews and Gentiles, though we know him primarily as apostle to the Gentiles, he is sent to both Jews and Gentiles with this mission to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, similar to Paul being blinded on the road to Damascus and seeing the light, and from the power of Satan, which is associated with the darkness, to God, who is associated with the light, so that they all might receive forgiveness of sins, and a place among the people of God who have been set apart by faith, by trust in Jesus. 
That's Paul's theology in a nutshell. We don't get into an explanation here of justification by faith, but Paul is saying that what Jesus said to him on the road to Damascus and afterward was that he would be a witness in order to help people to see, to open their eyes, to turn from darkness to light and from Satan to God so that they might be forgiven and enjoy a place among those who are God's chosen people by faith in and through Jesus of Nazareth. And so Paul says, having had that vision, O king, I was not disobedient to it, but I began to proclaim the good news about the risen Messiah, Jesus, in Damascus, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and also to Gentiles. And that part infuriated many of Paul's opponents. To say to them that they should repent and turn to God and do deeds worthy of repentance, not just uh, a verbal repentance, but a true turning from sin in various forms in order to live lives well-pleasing to God in repentance. But it's for this reason, then, that the Jews seized me and tried to kill me. And to this day, though, I have had help from God, and so here I am, I stand here, testifying to everyone present, to the high and the lowly, to the small and the great, saying nothing but what has been taught, in my understanding, from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Bible, from the Scriptures, from the prophets and Moses, testifying that the Messiah must suffer contrary to contemporary first century Jewish thinking, the Messiah must suffer and will be the first one to rise from the dead to proclaim light. Remember earlier he said to turn from, from darkness to light. Light would be a concept well familiar to the Roman audience that's present here listening to Paul. Light symbolizes truth, goodness, beauty, uh, and, and if one turns to God, then one turns to the light, proclaiming the light to both our people, the Jews, and to the Gentiles. And so it seemed to Festus that Paul seemed to be ending his argument, or climaxing it anyway, and so Festus butts in while Paul was making his defense and said, Holy cow, Paul, you're out of your mind! Too much learning has driven you mad. You are insane. But Paul said, no, Festus, most excellent Festus, I'm not out of my mind. I'm speaking the sober truth. In fact, King Agrippa knows about these things, and I speak freely to him. I'm certain that, he, that the things I've been mentioning have not escaped his notice since none of this rise of early Christianity has been done under a bushel, in a corner, uh, out of public view. But this has been something that has been uh, apparent in early Christianity, in first century Judaism, that Agrippa would be aware of. And so Paul turns to Agrippa and says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. I know you believe the prophets. So, by implication, Agrippa, you should understand that the prophets say that the Messiah will suffer and die and rise again and proclaim good news from God to all people. Don't you believe that, King Agrippa? Then Agrippa says to Paul, Are you so quickly persuading me to become a Christian? Or in such a short time, do you hope to make me a Christian? The Greek text actually says, to make a Christian. Do you make me a Christian in such a short time? Too, too quickly, Paul. Paul says, well, whether or not it's quick, I do pray that you and all who are listening to me here who in this hall, all who are listening to me today, might become a Christian, such as I am, of course, except without being imprisoned for that belief, without these chains. 
And so apparently the hearing is over because the king gets up. When the king gets up, everybody gets up. So they all arose, the governor too, and Bernice, and those who had been seated with them, and probably everyone in the hall, uh, you know, like when the judge comes into court, all rise, and everybody got up when the king got up. And they were leaving. And as they were leaving, they, who is the they? The king, Bernice, Festus, other officials who were there, as they were leaving, they all said to one another, well, this has been an interesting theological discussion, but this man has done nothing deserving death or imprisonment. These are articles of belief and controversy among Jewish people about the status of their Messiah and whether or not Jesus, whom they say is dead, Paul says is alive, and the implications of that. It's all a set of beliefs within the Jewish religion that in no way is about violations of Roman law. He deserves n neither death nor imprisonment. In fact, if he hadn't appealed to the emperor, he could have been set free. And that's where Acts 26 ends. Uh, but let me say on this note, why couldn't Agrippa and Festus just declare Paul innocent and free to go? Well, once you appeal to the emperor, that makes you under the emperor, emperor's jurisdiction. You can't pull a case out from under the appeal to the emperor. Uh, that would cause the emperor to wonder why somebody who had appealed to the emperor was not worthy to be heard by the emperor. What were Agrippa and Festus hiding that they didn't want the emperor to know about? Well, once you appeal to the emperor, no Roman official was allowed to withdraw a case from that appeal. And so Paul has to be sent on now to Rome, probably with included in the letter that would be sent to the emperor accompanying Paul, that would be include statements that neither Festus himself nor Agrippa found anything worthy of death or imprisonment in their examination of Paul. And that would go with Paul as a part of the case notes uh, that would accompany Paul on his journey to Jerusalem to be heard by the emperor. And we will find more of that journey uh, as Paul begins the next phase of transport, transfer to the jurisdiction of Rome and the emperor that Acts 27 and 28 tell us about. Again, thank you for being part of the Monday study group, and I call you to a blessed and holy Lent. Thanks be to God.